Now another one with a similar accent, who's been here a long time and actually pretends he doesn't like cricket at all. I just want to say before he gets up here and starts his oration that ignore anything he says about relationship with me, I must tell you up front that I had no relationship whatever with his mother, not even social and certainly not I did not know her in the biblical thing, so let's get that thing straight. However, a man I'm pl pr proud to call, if not relation, friend, Robin Williams, um, the presenter for many, many years of the uh, ABC Science Show, the man that was holding the other end of the strop when Ockham was uh, honing his razor, <laughs> and a man who wrote, used my name in his last book, for which I'm eternally grateful, Robin Williams. Thank you, son. <laughs> it's one of the problems of agreeing to talk at a conference that uh, some months later you find out what um, title you gave off the top of your head three months before. And I see that I was talking about being struck by lightning. Now, that's, as it turns out, absolutely appropriate because when I wrote Unintelligent Design, things start, started to go terribly wrong. And uh, the two things that notably have gone wrong are, A, when I went to interview Richard Dawkins, I uh, for once was not carrying the 12 kilo Nagra that Peter Pockley gave me in 1972, and which I'd been carrying around the world. In fact, I was two metres tall at one stage, and you can see that uh, that is no longer the case. And that machine never went wrong. I went to Richard's place and... Uh, there was Lala Ward, his wife, famous from Tom Baker and Doctor Who, and we had a lovely lunch, and I turned on the tape recorder, I recorded 34 minutes, and I went back to my rooms opposite New College, where Richard has been a fellow for a long time, and I played the first five minutes, and I went there. And I did not dare look to see what the rest were like, but um, I postponed the experience until two weeks ago, when it turned out that out of 34 minutes about 17 were left. And this is the equivalent in broadcasting of being struck by lightning from something there out to get you. The other example was just now when I was booked on the 10 o'clock plane from Sydney. It's now <laughs> quarter past two and I've only just arrived. Each step was fraught with a little gremlin with this mean streak. And I just got to the middle of Melbourne and there's this demonstration. <laughs> so in some ways, I'm, I'm on the turn, daddy, son, whoever you are. Uh, the question is why I actually wrote a book like that. And it wasn't for the same reason as Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. Because when I was asked by a few people whether I was an atheist, I thought, well as some have actually put in print before, do I think about God enough to call myself an atheist in a kind of God-rejecting sense? And as I put in the beginning of the book, I don't think about God much at all. It doesn't figure in my life, except in taxis in Melbourne. <laughs> and it's different with someone like Richard Dawkins, who is extraordinarily cross and has written a book which is the equivalent of Philip, Philip Adams, my other father's uh, book, uh, Adams versus God. And that's my subtitle for this talk, because I wonder from the starting point of being sceptical what we're being sceptical about. Now, there's no question that Richard Dawkins was being, from a scientific point of view, sceptical about God. And I was being sceptical about intelligent design, as it's called, very much from a political point of view. I was outraged by the politics of what seemed to me uh, a really mischievous manipulation of people's ideas about science. And I was outraged by their treatment of science and also their treatment of what was supposed to be democratic politics in the United States. So I agreed to write something and protested to my dear editor, Richard, Walsh that um, 
I felt reluctant to do so because I'm not an expert, I'm a journalist, and I can't, don't have the time to become even vaguely close to being an expert. And so having read again The Blind Watchmaker written in 1988, it struck me that it's all there anyway. Why do they need Williams to fulminate even in brief form? But now it's out. It was a very interesting experience to be interviewed by a whole lot of people, not least by someone on a Christian radio station. Now, the person who was producing the program for this Christian radio station, I don't remember what station it is, uh, mainly because they didn't pay attention, not because they don't have the highest respect for what they're doing, it's fine. But he got hold of someone in North America, a woman, who'd written a book in favour of intelligent design, based on the fact that she thought, if you look around the universe, it seems to be made from top down. And I was rather taken aback by the experience of supposedly having a debate with this person, because she just went... No. I said, that's not the argu that's not an argument. Um, <laughs> just saying no. Um, and I'll give you an example. I said that I was rather taken aback by what had happened with intelligent design in the United States because it seemed to me to be something that had been carefully organized by various aspects of the religious right, mainly because it delivered lots of votes to George W. Bush. And she said, that isn't true. I live here implying I live in Australia and therefore was wrong. Again, I said, but that's not an argument. <laughs> but she had a much louder voice, and so I eventually uh, gritted my teeth and kind of gave up. Um, however, it seemed to me very interesting if you look at some of the evidence, not least the Republican War on Science by Chris Mooney, who, by the way, is going to be here in Melbourne in April for the World Conference of Science Journalists, and also at, uh, well... Newsweek and Time magazine, for, for, for that matter. And I sent an email to the, my antagonist, and she said she hadn't read them. However, as a matter of kind of random selection, if you look at the New York Review of Books, just published an article by Professor Gary Wills, I'll just give you three paragraphs. It is less known that for social services, that's in the US government, Evangelical organizations were given the same right to draft bills and install the officials who implement them. Karl Rove had cultivated the extensive network of religious right organizations, and they were consulted at every step of the way as the administration set up its policies on gays, AIDS, condoms, abstinence programs, creationism, and other matters that concern the evangelicals. All the ev evangelicals' resentments under previous presidents, including Republicans like Reagan and the first Bush, were now being addressed. The head lobbyist for the Family Research Council, I think that speaks for itself as an organization, boasted that a lot of FRC people are in place in the administration. The evangelicals knew which positions could affect their agenda, whom to replace, and whom they wanted appointed. This was true for the Centers for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, and health and human services, agencies that would rule on our administra administration matters dear to the heart of evangelical causes. Finally, the White House was alive with piety. Evangelical leaders were in and out on a regular basis. There were Bible study groups in the White House, as in John Ashcroft's Justice Department. Over half the White House staff attended the meetings. One of the first things David Frum heard when he went to work there as a speechwriter was, missed you at the Bible study. According to Esther Kaplan, writing in 2004, aside from Rove and Cheney, Bush's inner circle are all deeply religious. Condoleezza Rice is a minister's daughter, chief of staff Andrew Card is a minister's husband, Karen Hughes is a church elder, and head speechwriter Michael Gerson is a born-again evangelical movement insider. A final little aside, which I found um, probably the most disturbing of all, talking about uh, the Iraq War. Um, General William Boykin, a man leading the search for bin Laden, headquarters in Iraq, quote, ask yourself this, why is this man in the White House, talking about Bush, the majority of Americans did not vote for him. Why is he there? And I tell you, this morning, he's in the White House because God put him there for such a time as this. God put him there to lead not only this nation, 
but to lead the world in such a time as this. Well, um, it seems to me that if you mount all that evidence, <laughs> it is absolutely overwhelming. So that was my reason for being concerned and my reason for writing about unintelligent design. It was about the politics, but it's also to some extent an excuse to look at the science and to have fun with that. However, I would ask the question, can you go from the other direction and examine theology, examine the belief in God, religious structures, using science? And I think this is to some extent where, where Richard has had an unfortunate time. Uh, I was startled to see in the uh, London Review of Books a review of uh, The God Delusion, which is written by Terry Eagleton, an ex-fellow professor at Oxford and a philosopher, although he is a professor at the moment uh, in Manchester in, in, in English. And he criticizes Richard Dawkins' writing along these lines. Imagine someone holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the British Book of Birds, and you have a rough idea of what it's like to read Richard Dawkins on theology. Card-carrying rationalists like Dawkins, who is the nearest thing to a professional atheist we have had since Bertrand Russell, are in one sense the least well-equipped to understand what they castigate, since they don't believe there is anything there to be understood, or at least anything worth understanding. That is why they invariably come up with vulgar caricatures of religious faith that would make a first-year theology student wince. The more they detest religion, the more ill-informed their criticisms of it tend to be. If they were asked to pass judgment on phenomenology or the geopolitics of South Asia, they would no doubt bone up on the questions as assiduously as they could. But when it comes to theology, however, any shoddy old travesty would pass muster. And then he gives lots of examples about ways in which Richard seems to be rather opaque about a number of things he quotes to do with the Bible and so forth. Final paragraph. Now, it may well be that all this is no more plausible than the tooth fairies talking about the religious beliefs of many people. Most reasoning people these days will see excellent grounds to reject religion, but critics of the richest, most enduring form of popular culture in human history have a moral obligation to confront that case at its most persuasive, rather than grabbing themselves a victory on the cheap by savaging it as so much garbage and gobbledygook. The mainstream theology I have just outlined may well not be true, but anyone who holds it is, in my view, to be respected whereas Dawkins considers that no religious belief, any time or anywhere, is worthy of any respect whatsoever. This one might note is the opinion of a man deeply averse to dogmatism. Even moderate religious views, he insists, are to be ferociously contested, since they can always lead to fanaticism. So there we've got a couple of polls. Um, I think he's being rather unfair to Richard, and I think he's been, being unfair in many ways because he sees, him, sees him himself on, again, another political side. Um, Terry, I don't know whether he still is, but has been a Marxist and viewed the selfish gene stance of Richard Dawkins, now 30 years old, as a kind of Trojan horse for capitalism. But the other thing is, is quite interesting about Richard is he seems to be slightly reluctant always to talk about politics. In fact, when I asked him about the ways in which religion quite often seems to be punitive and how very few religions where you're having a lot of fun seem to last, you know, I often quote the orange people where it's sex, drugs and rock and roll. So why isn't that taken over the world? You know, the fantastic thing that you could do. Why is it that you have so many religions which take away music, which take away pictures, which take away booze. Imagine taking away wine. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> you know, as I look at my clock and I think, well, it's um, four minutes, four hours to June o'clock. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'd go terribly well in Mecca, but how is it that these religions manage to be so punitive. I asked Richard this and he said he didn't know, but then having talked about his own view of religion being a byproduct of something else, 
I think you may know this if you've read The God Delusion or heard my interview with him two weeks ago, that if you are a human being evolved over tens of thousands of years to get on in a pretty rough world and as a child being amongst all the animals, mammals for that matter, especially vulnerable, then it helps very, very, very much if you obey your fathers like I obey Barry Williams. And you, you take what is given about cliffs, saber-toothed tigers and fire um, and, and you respond to being chastised and therefore you are kind of ingrained in a form of behaviour which seems to have lapsed in modern society amongst teenagers but let that pass. <laughs> and so what he, Richard is saying is we have this not exactly a tabula rasa of the brain, but we have a capacity to obey. And many of the religions have exploited this capacity in, sa in the same way, oddly enough, as those who incarcerated the poor bastards on Norfolk Island managed to dehumanize them by giving them absolutely no freedom and giving them no predictability about pleasure or pain or justice or injustice. It was a random thing. And so when McConaughey turned up, if you read The Fatal Shore, it's one of the most poignant examples of, of, of history, the way a kind man turns up, actually a Christian man, and um, tried to treat these people like human beings. And many of them, he, as, as uh, Hughes says, were, were so bastardized that they continued to be, behave like cringing curs. There is a capacity in people to obey too far. This seems to me, going back to the politics, to be one of the most interesting things about the way religion seems to be a kind of virus. Maybe Richard means it in a different way from the way I mean it. The way it seems to make people obey leaders who are essentially both demagogues and tyrants. This is the thing I loathe most of all. And if you look at the science, it seems to me one of the greatest challenges that um, science still has to face. There have been lots of experiments, as you know, in, indeed at the University of New South Wales. About uh, 25 years ago, there was an experiment where you took a, a, a bunch of people and you separated them into prisoners and wardens. And within a week, the behavior of the wardens was so shocking. <laughs> that uh, in to, to some extent they had to stop the experiment. And the prisoners similarly began to feel guilty about something that they hadn't actually done. So it makes you wonder if you have more than just one week, but months if not years of this kind of treatment where it might lead. So much for the politics. I talked about playing with ideas in science. Looking at the origins of religion beyond that is, is quite interesting as you know Lewis Wolpert has also published a book quite recently, as has Daniel Dennett, giving various versions of the way they see religion having been invented and being almost a necessary thing as part of human evolution. And uh, Lewis Wolpert, who's got strong associations with Australia, um, having been trained as an engineer, sees an engineering view that uh, if you look around the world and see cause and effect, then you obviously are looking for a cause for there being a universe. And it also helps if along the way you can have some explanation as to what happens when you die. In other words, you go on to somewhere else. De Dennett looking far more at the ways in which, and if you think about it, all these electric lights, by the way, that's in environmentally, we don't need all those. We could have half of them and still get on perfectly well. But the, the electric lights, which have changed our civilization, it's only about, 200 years that there's been constant light. Before that, we had all this darkness in which, in the absence of a fire, we could just be thinking about stuff. Imagine there being in the forest and you're cogitating after your meal, if you had one, the meaning of life. You would naturally, as Dennett says, begin perhaps to muse to your now distant relatives, maybe they've died, and be talking to them like I sometimes talk to Barry in the depths of night, you know, Barry guide me as to what I should be doing tomorrow at the ABC and how not to lose my temper quite so often about things that happen to me. And you're beginning to 
vouchsafe something as if you're talking to a real person. And as Dennett says, it's only one small step to be talking to someone who you imagine is kind of still there and to erect not just a ritual, but a set of totems. And then um, the final thing, which Jared Diamond discusses, and which I think is bringing us back to the politics, and indeed that quotation from the general in Iraq, as a rallying tool, those flags and totems are extraordinarily powerful. However, one of the most interesting things about looking at the science and looking at origins, it seems to me, is looking at cosmology. Now, you all know, because you're amazingly bright people, the number of uh, books that have been published very recently. Uh, well, going back, if you like, to uh, just six numbers, only six numbers, by Martin Rees. The Goldilocks idea, which now Paul Davies has um, looked into even further. Now, because you were here having lunch, you weren't listening to my wireless program today, which deeply disappoints me, but it's repeated at 7 o'clock <laughs> on Monday evening. <laughs> Statement of fact. I mean. And what we're trying to do in that program is a continuation of what Paul Davies was talking about in terms of his latest views on those six numbers and those multiverses. Now, the one thing that really annoyed many reviewers about Richard Dawkins' book is that he then says, OK, well, if, if, if the universe is really finely tuned or top-down, as my interlocutor said during my Christian um, radio station interview, then, of course, one way to sidestep that is to look at other universes which are quite different. Now, I think that that's a bit of a conjuring trick. Yes, we have an amazing situation, and we could only be here in an amazing situation that is geared in terms of physics, for life. However, what Paul Davies is saying is that you can look at the universe in a different way. Not that there are several sets of different physics in the beginning, at the very small level, at the very large level, you know, small for Max Planck, um, large for Newton, and a bit of Einstein, um, different for the first couple of nanoseconds and so forth. What he's saying is that the universe has contingent laws depending on what it's doing at the time. And he's saying that it is a bit like a computer with a computer program. As the computer changes, the computer program would be different. So the laws aren't there, given by God or anyone else, as a kind of external thing, but an intrinsic thing. I think this is quite fascinating because the other end of what we were doing today on the wireless was asking about a similar complex system, namely you. You've got a trillion cells and, of course, a 10 trillion of other cells, you know, what the limit of you is. <laughs> and your visitors is a very interesting thing. You've got 10 times as much ge genetic material from interlopers as you have <laughs> from what your genome was given in the beginning. And somehow all this is coordinated. And the other examples that we had in the program were the ways in which shoals of fish, flocks of birds, also coordinate. And there are 10,000 of them, imagine, in the ocean, these tiny fish, and they suddenly change direction. Is there a leader? The answer is no. So how on earth are they doing it? Well, the answer in terms of complexity is that essentially they're just doing what their immediate neighbor does. And the pattern, the coordination is intrinsic. The way Dennis Noble, who's professor of physiology at Oxford, describes it is he's often asked, being an expert, on the way that the heart works. At which point is there the molecule which is the, the rhythm giver? And he says, there ain't one. <laughs> It's only when the cardiac cells have gathered together to form a sufficient critical mass to be called a heart that then you have rhythm that's part of the fact that it is a heart. So it seems to me that when you start looking at questions of top-down, you know, what is the nature of integration and complexity in, in physical systems or biological systems, 
to answer the question of Goldilocks and whether the universe was made top down or whatever or design. You begin to get a number of questions answered which are absolutely fascinating and take the science to a, a different level. And that's why I find it so terribly disappointing that uh, Terry Eagleton decided to trash Richard Dawkins because it seems to me even though Richard was possibly taking some of this too far, some of the answers he was giving about the ways in which, for example, you can get the development out of sticks that he had in his computer, something that eventually, very quickly actually, looked like insects evolving, tells you fantastic things about the way biology happens and science develops uh, as a concept than you had before. And so I, just to sum up, find it um, a, a rather astonishing thing, the ways in which the antagonisms have been spelled out and the way that the politics seem to be working. I would suggest that there are ways in which we can take some of these questions further and to ask how it is that we have such gigantic numbers of people. Hello, sir, you coming to take me off? Do you know, there's a wonderful... Um, uh, well, I, yeah, it's a, it's a bit like we're about to land, you know, they, they say, uh, would you um, get, get yourself ready and put out your thing, and 25 minutes later you actually hit the deck, it's very worrying. Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, if you actually look at the numbers of people who have religious belief, I have a random list that uh, I actually culled from the um, New, Science, New Statesman, and I mention this simply because of the, what was uh, mentioned by Martin in the last um, talk. Uh, it's, it's really astounding. Christianity, 2.1 billion. Islam, 1.2 billion. Hindus, 900 million. Buddhism, 708 million. Sikhs, 23 million. Jews, only 14 million. Quite a surprising number for the, the kind of nuisance and... and, and noise <laughs> we make. <laughs> Baha'i, I like Baha'i, 7 million. Jainism, 4.2. Shinto, 4. Zoroastrians, 2.5 million. An awful lot of people in the world still. And an awful lot of people still believing in creationist ideas rather than uh, taking a scientific viewpoint. The latest I came across, again in the New Statesman, from Peter Wilby, who used to edit it. According to a poll this year, 48% of the British public believe in evolution. I think believe in is probably a bit uh, a harsh way to put it. While 39% believe in creationism or intelligent design. 39% of Brits. I would have believed that of Americans, but not Brits. Um, so should the BBC, after an hour-long program on, re on re evolution, balance it by allowing just under 49 minutes for the alternatives? I suspect... If they asked us to do that at the ABC, Paul Willis, we'd say, Whatever you like, sir. Whatever you like, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I'm suspicious of all of the polls alleging people have certain religions. And what I believe happens is that if you're a telephone and someone says, Do you have a religion? It's pretty much like the, what happens in courts when people are asked, Do they wish to take the oath or affirm? Most people seem to think it's slightly disgraceful to affirm and you're really telling the truth if you take the oath, even though I know many of them are in fact atheists. And I think similarly if they ask you, do you have a religion? Well, it's a bit risky to say no, they think, and it doesn't really matter if you don't, so say you're Christian. Oh, I or say you're Anglican, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> can that? Yes, okay. Well, I was hitchhiking across um, Asia many years ago and got to Pakistan. They had a big form and under religion, I just put a stroke of a pen. And they, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You put, put a religion. I said, no, I said, no, no religion. No. But you must have a <laughs> So I put congregational hedonist. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was great, because it was nice, you know, two huge, long words. Uh, I would ask, however, if you are skeptical about those figures, how do we get better ones? Because... I've looked at a whole bunch of them, and the more I look into these things, the more bothered I am. I was at the University of New South Wales, uh, having been asked a question about 
in Australia, of course, nobody believes half of these silly things. And a bloke stood up and said, do you realise how many Pentecostalists there are now? You know, young people who are being swept in vast numbers. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big number, and I think it's worth keeping up with the figures somehow. I don't think it'll last. I, uh, I think it's fad. I do. Um, I was, I go along with Fred there, I was asked, I was giving, I hasten to add, giving character evidence in a court case once, and uh, I went onto the stand and uh, the bailiff or the judge's bum boy or whatever he's called, whizzed up to tip staff, yeah, whizzed up to me with a Bible and I said, I'll affirm. And he looked at me, he didn't know what the hell I was talking about actually. <laughs> and the judge said, Mr. Williams wishes to make an affirmation. And the bloke still looked at me, still tried to hand me the Bible. Presumably I could have had it upside down or something. But uh, I, I do think that, I think the big religious issue in Australia is still the one there always was. And that's, um, it's not so much the, the Pentecostals. I, I, I think that's a fad. I really do. I, I think uh, people are whizzing off to Hillsong because they're sick of the Anglican or the Catholic. Mm. I think the big religious difference in Australia is the one that's always been there, and that's between moderate people and conservative Catholicism. Have a look at the... And one of the big changes that's happened politically in Australia that leads to that is I remember in Menzies' cabinet there was one cap Catholic, he happened to be my local member, Jack Kramer, Minister of the Army. Now half the cabinet are Catholics and cons from the Conservatives. So I think that's where the big religious issue is in Australia and the, as opposed to the way it is in the United States. But that's just an impression. Could I just add to that uh, and then I'll ask Paul Willis. Um, in, in, in Richard Dawkins' book, he actually quotes a number of people who he says have a reputation for believing in God, like Einstein, and it turns out that if you examine what they actually said, it's like Gorbachev referring to God in a metaphorical sense. And two lovely quotations of, of Einstein. It says, it was, it was, of course, a lie, what you read about my religious convictions, a lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I've never denied this, but I've expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world so far as science can reveal it. That's what Einstein actually said. Now, I tested that because Richard said um, a whole number of people, even bishops, <laughs> are actually not believers. And the next day, I saw Robert Winston, who is a friend of mine, a Jewish person, who's actually made a series on God, uh, based on the fact that he has an intense belief in, in his Jewish culture. And I asked him, do you believe in God, or do you think that, rather like Richard suggests, that you've got a habit of filling in the form? And, and he said, he's probably right. Ultimately, he doesn't believe. And he's just made a three-part series for the BBC on God and published a book. <laughs> Um, I, I want to run past you an argument that uh, our colleague John Cleary runs by me every so often, and that is that uh, going back to Thomas Huxley in his def defence of, of Darwinism, uh, then used that as a basis for his atheism, and that creationism sprung out of not so much trying to negate evolutionary theory, but as a backlash against evolutionary theory being the underpinning of atheism. And Dawkins himself has also been accused of doing this, of using science as his uh, rationale for being an atheist. Is there any truck in that argument, do you think? Well, that's what it looks like from the outside, doesn't it? Mm. You know, some of the things I quoted from Terry Eagleton about Richards being almost evangelical. Now, I asked him that that was an interesting thing that... Um, the part of the interview that was not wiped was my asking him, Dawkins, are you being evangelical yourself? Are you trying? Because he says in the book he wants to convert people. He wants people to, who, who believe to finish the book as unbelievers. He says so. And I wouldn't dare say that in anything I wrote. <laughs> so it would be implicit in that sort of action. And I would imagine that if you are discussing things in an antagonistic way, as Thomas Huxley, the bulldog, often did, 
then it would be a natural result for people to take offence and rush off in the other direction. But if you think of what it was, 1859 and thereafter, all this came as a tremendous shock to people. And I would have thought, these days you have a different situation. I think science is simply give, being given the flick. It's not seen as a powerful thing, although people like Eagleton do say that Dawkins and, and others should spend more time looking at the bad effects, as they perceive it, as, uh, uh, of science. But instead they see science not as a zillion concepts by a double zillion people, but by another set of high priests. <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's another collection of vomits, very old men in ties, um, <laughs> laying down another set of laws. And if only they knew the sceptics and how easygoing and outward go, you know, relaxed they are. I, I went, to, in fact, to talk at the Theosophical Society in Sydney uh, with some trepidation. Wonderfully nice people. And it seems to me that uh, the, the effect that you describe in 2006 is only something that you perceive if you've had no contact with uh, people directly. But, you know, there's the stuff being banged on about in the popular, popular media. Robin, you've made uh, some mention of Paul Davies, much respected physicist, and his um, strong bonding to... Uh, the strong principle, um, anthropomorphic principle, that the universe is so finely tuned that um, there must be a God. I'd like to uh, point out to this audience and to uh, yourself that there is a re strong rebuttal of that view by Victor Stenger, professor of physics at Hawaii. He's actually written a program analysing various universes with different electron to... Uh, to uh, proton ratios and Fermi constants and such like. And it turns out there's something like, in his small range of investigation, a hundred possible universes that would work perfectly well, not just this one, as Paul Davies alleges. Well, he doesn't allege, because if you look at the transcript of my programme two weeks ago, he dismisses the need for a god as a creator as so much nonsense. He says... It's something that does not arise from the new ways of looking at the physics of cosmology. He actually said so twice, and it's worth looking up. Uh, he, he says he views uh, these ideas and complexity differently. Now, uh, he says for the last three years, he's had a different kind of view about the nature of the universe as this sort of contingent, evolving thing with its embedded laws, if you like, changing as the universe changes. And um, what, what he actually says about his personal beliefs, once he said to me, he hasn't been to church since he was 18. He, he does not have any role in being an apologist for God, and as far as I can tell, never has. But it's in writing in the science show two weeks ago, and it's, I think, also to some extent in his book, The uh, Goldilocks Enigma. Um, I'm sorry I don't have better evidence than um, Philip Adams interviewing Barry Jones on his new book on the ABC late line the other night. God talking to God, what more do you need? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when Barry was being quizzed on the influence of religion in politics in um, modern Australia, he was saying that there was reasonable evidence for things like Nazism, uh, communism, um, ancient Greeks and Romans, that when societies lost their faith in God, they didn't last very long. That when they lost their faith in God, they didn't last very long. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they've, they've, they've <laughs> it depend, depends on which gods. You see, the way Jared Diamond looks at this, uh, in terms of moral systems, he says, having spent so much time in Papua New Guinea, they might have zillions of religions, but there are none of them which have any element of thou shalt in them. There are a whole variety of different religions which have had a variety of different effects on the societies which have evolved around them. Uh, however, it seems to me that there is a useful exercise if you actually adopt Richard Dawkins' view in a sociological sense. Imagine that um, 
religion is in fact a byproduct, and then examine various groups, not necessarily nations, but groups of people living together in smaller societies about how they organize themselves, how they reduce conflict. One way of doing this, some people have said, there have been no major wars between democracies. That's one way of looking at it. Another uh, has been to look at the way communications through the new technology, mobile phones, I don't have a mobile phone, but apparently when you get to about 20% of the population having mobile phones so that they can text each other and communicate very freely, you get a change in the way that violence is or is not perpetrated. So I think um, what, what, you, what you're looking at is a question I hesitate to answer off the top of my head because if you go back to civil the beginnings of civilization, that's 10,000 years, that's only 400 generations. That's only what, two or three times the number of people in this room and in, in terms of human history, it's a very small time. But I do believe that there are ways in which you can do a kind of study of the way people behave. But um, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, Adams versus Jones would have actually meant at the time. I'll have to look it up. Um, do you think Bishop Spong is really an atheist, but if he came out and admitted it, he wouldn't make as much money from selling books? <laughs> Well, I know, I've got some friends who are rather fond of Spong, <laughs> and um, I wouldn't want to malign their uh, motivation. But he does make a few quid, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, it's a very good business. And um, if you look at the guy who's just been sprung because he had um, all sorts of sexual habit, I mean, he had what, uh, the, the guy in the States, the evangelical. Haggart. Haggart, yes, that's right. 30 million adherents. I mean, enormous bloody industry. There's a few quid in that. Maybe Paul Willis and I should change our jobs, don't you think? <laughs> was that the last one? Hello. Hello. I was just wondering, um, religion's had over five or 6,000 years to develop, and science has only had a couple of hundred. Is there any chance of science succeeding in the end, or will we disappear in the meantime? Well, <laughs> I think science succeeding implies that it's going somewhere that's sort of organized, that there is a, it's a sort of promised land. I remember my, one of the reasons I wrote my book with Stalinism at the end, my father was not a Stalinist, but he was a communist. And uh, if you remember, there was a view, I think a banner over the river in Moscow had socialism, socialism plus electrification will build by implication, the promised land. Now, that sort of iron view of history has got <laughs> all sorts of hazards in it. I think um, the, the slosh factor in human affairs is substantial enough. I think what one ought to do is, going back to Barry Jones and uh, Philip Adams, uh, Barry Jones, of course, invented the Commission for the Future, uh, which Philip Adams chaired in the mid-'80s, and I then chaired after him. And the whole exercise of that was not to see ways in which either science or priests in beards, forgive me, Father, would uh, necessarily <laughs> tell you how you were supposed to live, but you were to imagine ways you might like to live and work towards them. And it seems to me one of the banes of our present society is to make us feel helpless that we are being pushed around by ideology, be it sometimes religious, on, on the one side, and a kind of engineering view of where we're going on the other, mainly made of freeways, uh, and the kind of emancipation of people's ideas about where they want to go comes last. And um, the, the sorts of things we used to do at the Commission for the Future, only three blocks away across the park, which was to enable people to feel they had the freedom to work out societies for themselves, you know, in 20. 30 years' time, and by a bit of back engineering, working out how they were going to get there. And I think that is, to me, the, the, the really libertarian way of going about things. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Robin.